Good morning, church. We are glad that you are joining us this morning on this beautiful Wednesday as we begin our time together with our morning devotion. And for some, it's uh, great for you to join us live uh, here at 9 a.m. For some, I know that you watch this on your lunch break or at dinner or before bed, and we're just glad that you're able to connect whenever it is that works for you. But for those who are joining us uh, this morning live, uh, thanks for joining us. And please share as uh, we continue to begin our day in the word of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yesterday, we started a new book, the book of joy. And so this past Sunday in church, we talked about the Bible from Genesis to Revelation being God's love letter to us. And so who wrote the book of love? God did. And in the book of joy in Philippians, who wrote the book of Philippians? The Apostle Paul did, as he's in chains in the gospel in Rome. We remember after the book of Acts, as we went through the book of Acts together, he appealed to go to Rome to Caesar to have his day in court. He had been taken prisoner for years, and so now he is in Rome. And what better thing to do in prison than to write a letter? What's surprising, though, is that it is a letter of joy. And that's why the book of Philippians is so powerful and also read a lot by Christians today, especially those who battle fear or anxiety or depression, because Paul's joy, he has learned, is a spiritual discipline that comes from his relationship with the Lord, not based on his circumstances, because his circumstances are dim. They don't look good. He's in prison in Rome. It looks like he's probably going to be executed, and so things are not going great, but you'd never know it by his attitude, by his witness, and by him continuing to proclaim the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ because he's doing it with great joy. And so in the book of Philippians, we're going to see this word over and over and over again, joy or rejoice. We're going to see this common theme throughout this book as he is thanking the church at Philippi that they have supported him with their prayers, with their financial support, and the proclaiming and the advancement of the gospel. As we think about a love letter and a letter of joy today, um, in the front of my Bible is a letter that my dad wrote to me when I graduated seminary. And it's his love letter to me of how proud he was, and um, I keep it in the front of my Bible. And so I want you to think about that letter, that text, that email, that post-it, where somebody along the line just gave you some incredible encouragement that you hold on to. And maybe you hold on to it and you go back to look at it. In my office, in one of the cabinets, is a huge box. And that box, over 17 years of ministry, is filled with cards and letters and things of encouragement. Because we know as followers of Jesus Christ, we go through our ups and downs and Sometimes it's just nice to be reminded to go back to that box or go back to that letter and know that you are reminded that Jesus loves you, but also that he's put people in your life that love you and encourage you on this journey. When we look at this letter of joy today, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 18, the advance of the gospel. Paul writes, I want you to know, brothers that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And so he wants to make sure that the church of Philippi and other brothers who are out preaching and teaching the gospel, other pastors and those gifted spiritual leaders, that they've heard the news that Paul is in chains in the gospel of Rome, and so they think it's bad news. But Paul wants them to know that this is actually good news, that God is using this and that he is continuing to move the kingdom forward. And so from a worldly perspective, it doesn't look good on the outside for the other brothers and pastors to hear about Pastor Paul being in prison. But he's saying, I want you to know that there's good news here. And so in verse 13, So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And so he's saying, don't look at this as bad news, it's good news. God is using this imprisonment and my pain and my suffering for the advancing of the gospel and the kingdom all throughout the imperial guard. So all those guards who take time to 
be in charge of Paul and to look after Paul, and not just the guards that take care of him, but the guards throughout Rome and all of those who find themselves in that job opportunity when it comes to Roman law, the words of Paul and his witness and his love and his joy for the Lord has spread throughout Rome. And not just Rome, but throughout the body of Christ. Of all those mission-planted churches, the word is spreading in the advancing of the gospel. And so what many might have thought was a bad thing of him being arrested and imprisoned in Rome, he's saying it's actually been a good thing. It's been a blessing. And God is using it to bless the lives of many others. And that's what he's saying here. Verse 14, And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord, by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He's saying for some brothers in Christ, they were a little afraid to speak the truth boldly, to speak that truth with love when it came to the word of the Lord. And since he's been imprisoned, Paul, he's saying the brothers have stepped up. Many of them are more bold now in speaking out the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that word, that they're not afraid. And so as he's been put on the sidelines, what many people think of him being in chains, he actually is still continuing to do kingdom work in the great advancement of the gospel, but also it has allowed the opportunity for other brothers to step up. And so um, it's been a great thing, not just for Paul and the advancement of the gospel, but also that the other brothers have stepped up to preach and to teach Jesus Christ crucified in a more bold way due to his imprisonment. Verse 15, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. He's saying when it comes to the kingdom of God, there are some Christians and some brothers who are preaching and teaching Christ, but some are doing that out of envy and rivalry. He's saying that there's some competitiveness sometimes in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know it shouldn't be like that, that it should all be about the kingdom and that as followers of Jesus, we're all on the same team. But we see this happen even in our day and age and in our world where churches compete against other churches or um, they're saying, well, this church is doing this and this church is doing that. Well, how come we're not doing this? When we get focused not on the gospel anymore and that we are in the same mission together with that one purpose of preaching Jesus Christ and his truth, that envy and rivalry and competition can happen. And Paul saying it happened back in his day. And so there's some preaching and teaching Christ, but they're doing it out of the wrong motive. But he's saying others, they're legit. They're authentic. They're doing it out of goodwill. And so we see that there. Verse 16, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. So those who are preaching and teaching in goodwill, authentic faith, they know that God is using this, my imprisonment, for the advance of the gospel. And they are doing it out of love. And that's what the Lord wants it to be all about. He says the former, they proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So, love, so some love the Apostle Paul. They love what he has done for the kingdom of God, his missionary journeys, and th everything that he's done. But there are others who um, are jealous of him or envious of him and do not think as highly as him. And so this is happening. And he's saying this conflict, this tension is there and it's real. But I just want you to know that God is using all of these things for the advance of the gospel. And so don't uh, focus on uh, the devil and what he's trying to do and the conflict and the tension he's trying to stir up here with me being in chains in the gospel. Instead, focus on what God is doing and how he is using it for the kingdom of the Lord. And so then he asks this question in verse 18, what then with this conflict and this tension, some who are goodwill and authentic faith and who love me and support me and are about the advancement of the gospel and yet others are envious or jealous, what shall we do then? He's saying, he goes on to say, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed and in that I rejoice. So above the conflict and the tension and being in chains in the gospel, the Apostle Paul is saying, I'm choosing joy. He has learned the spiritual discipline of joy and that joy comes not from his circumstances, but his relationship in the Lord 
and that he knows that everything that is happening to him is being used for the spread of the good news of the gospel. And that's what we take away today, church, that everything in our life, good or bad, God is on the move and is using it to not only mold and shape us personally, but also to be a witness to others and to use it to advance the gospel in the kingdom of God here locally in our families, in our community, in our nation, but also around the globe because that's how our God works. And so today I encourage you to send an email, a text, a post-it, or uh, go back old school like the Apostle Paul and write a little letter of love and encouragement to somebody who's encouraged you along the way in the ministry of Jesus Christ. And as you're reminded of them and as you send these words, it's not only helpful for you to rejoice and to find joy that God has put that person in your life, but it also can be joyful for them because you don't know what it is that they're going through. And just maybe today they need to hear that pick me up that what they have done in your life and encouraging you has made a difference. And that it also makes a difference in their life. And so that's what I challenge you to do today to send some words of love and affirmation, however you want to send it to a brother or sister in the faith that Christ has put in your life that has helped you along in the journey. And it's a great time to take time out today to do that. We bow our heads to pray. Gracious Father in heaven, Lord, we are thankful that you love us unlike anybody else in the world, that you are true love, that you love us unconditionally, so much so that you put that love in action by sending us a Savior, Jesus Christ, who came down from heaven to walk upon this earth to live a perfect life for us so that in him we are the righteous people of God. Not because it's our own perfection, but because of our perfection comes through grace, through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for everyone who's loved, encouraged, and supported us along our journey as we follow you, Lord. And we're thankful for the people that you've put in those places to help us along the way. And we rejoice that you've also used our lives and the lives of others along their journey. Help us today put that special person in our heart as we write that letter of encouragement or that text or that email or to send that letter that uh, it would be fruitful for the kingdom of God to build up your body as we continue to be about your mission and purpose, to build believers, to reach out and connect people to you, our Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. Church, have a blessed day in the Lord. Rejoice in the blessings and rejoice in no matter what your circumstances are today because of your faith and your love and trust in Jesus. God's blessings, church. Have a blessed day in Christ. Amen.